These are the days of wine and roses. These are the days of love. As long as an Islamic jihadi doesn't blow you to heaven above. Love life while you can, my friends. The ones who love death can't wait till it ends. Ladies and gentlemen, that's right. It's a poem. That means it's this week in jihad. We choose the cow. And we are here with David Wood. David, good morning, afternoon, and evening, sir. How are you? Hey, how you doing, Robert? David, these are exciting times. And I am very, I am, I am absolutely excited these days because we have had momentous news. And the momentous news involves the... Wait, 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 let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. It's the Muslim cowboy defending child marriage. Yeah, that was big. That was big because all the oh, jihadis <laughs> and all the converts and all the apologists nowadays... They're all in for child marriage after they've been denying it, calling us liars for a hundred years. Now suddenly, oh yes, of yeah, course, we can't wait to marry the third grader. Yeah, I think you can establish this as a rule. Whatever they say we're lying about, fast forward 10 years and they'll all be shouting it from the rooftops. It's just So right now, whatever they're still saying we're lying about, just wait another five or 10 years and they'll all be shouting it from the rooftops and saying that they've always, they always claimed that. Weird, weird, wild stuff. Weird, wild stuff. That's it. But no, uh, yeah, so you have, yeah, so, so, now, so now you have, you, now you have two things. One, uh, you have this, what we call, uh, you know, sudden onset jihadi syndrome or something like that, where uh, you get these new converts and ah, I got to go wage jihad. But now, if they go in a dawa direction, it's you got sudden on that defend pedophilia syndrome, where oh, I just converted, so now I instantly have to start defending child marriage. And it's every it's it's so it's it's the Muslim cowboy. He reverted and instantly started defending child marriage. Rosie from Rosie's Corner, she reverted. She puts new revert in all her all her videos, and she has multiple videos defending child marriage. Sneeko, we've got Sneeko on video right before he became a Muslim, saying, oh, child marriage, that's gross. And right after he becomes a Muslim, he says, you know, after doing more research, I've discovered that child marriage is actually really, really good and important for, for society. We shouldn't be judging. And it's like, what? what? If I knew nothing else uh, about your religion other than as soon as people convert to it, they automatically start defending child marriage, that would kind of be enough for me. Well, you know, I also think, in all seriousness, that it is a sign of the Dawah in the West moving to the next level. That we know, mm -hmm. going all the way back to Ibn Ishaq, Muhammad's first biographer, the exegesis of the Quran's uh, jihad chapters are about tolerance first, and then defensive jihad, and then offensive jihad. In other words, you grow progressively more aggressive as you gain in numbers and power. And so I think that that's what we're seeing in the West, that they've gained in numbers and power. And so they don't Wait. have to keep lying to us about how Islam rejects all this and the Islamophobes are making it up. Now they can say, yeah, sure, we're for all that. But but wait a minute, Robert, didn't we also tell people that? Didn't we also tell people that as it grows and expands, it changes? And, and it, didn't we didn't we say this pattern goes goes all the way back that in the Muslim sources, it's, uh, you know, if you're totally outnumbered and can't hope to win a physical confrontation, then, uh, you know, promote, pretend to promote peace and tolerance, wage stealth jihad. Uh, and then as your numbers grow, then you can start waging defensive jihad. So other people are doing something and you react to it and, and go on a killing spree. And then uh, and then after that, once you're even more powerful, then you could just dominate and subjugate it. Didn't we, didn't we tell people that, that it becomes more aggressive the more it spreads? And now, like, like, like is, put it this way, is there anything, like one thing we were saying 10 years ago that hasn't, that hasn't proven absolutely correct? Nary a thing. It turns out we were telling the wow. truth about all of it. And we're 100 percent accurate all along. Isn't that wow. amazing? Pretty and shocking. So yet another. Hey, actually, David, the big news that 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 we have this week is actually another example of that, because this the big news, of course, comes out of India, and in India they have just inaugurated a big new Hindu temple, 
And this would not be international news, except for the fact that it is built on the uh, site of a mosque. And all the uh, international media is in a tizzy saying, oh, the Islamophobia, it's so terrible that they tore down this mosque and they built a Hindu temple there. But, as it turns out, the mosque was itself built on the site of an earlier temple, and that this is a sacred place for Hinduism. It's understood to be the birthplace of the god Ram, and consequently, this is a very important site. Do you think there was anybody who was saying 10, 15 years ago, maybe around the time of the Ground Zero Mosque, that Muslims had a tendency to build mosques on the sacred sites of conquered peoples? Now, 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 Robert, if, if you were seriously claiming that like Islam is just obsessed with controlling the religious sites of other people, then we would expect them to, to take over the Kaaba. I mean, that was the closest one. I mean, that was a pagan shrine. If, if, if they really were obsessed with taking over other people's religious sites, they would have taken over the Kaaba. Yeah, they, were, they might have even built a mosque on the Temple Mount. Yeah, they might have done that. Or, you know, you know, back in the day, the biggest church in the world was Hagia Sophia. They would have taken that if they were really obsessed. And if they were really obsessed, then then they would have taken over this uh, this site that, that Hindus believe is the, the birthplace of of Ram. And so, I mean, yeah, there's the, the evidence just just flies in your face, Robert. <laughs> it just reminds me, you know, I've been thinking the last few days since this happened, and I really have to congratulate the Indian people, the government of India, for having the courage to do this in the face of international outrage and the Muslim victimhood and all this business, that they have said this is land that belongs to the Hindus. It's the site of a Hindu temple. We're going to put a Hindu temple there. We are not going to acquiesce to this conquest, subjugation, and erasure of our history. And it reminded me of the days when the uh, developer Sharif El Gamal, uh, a Muslim in New York City, was going to build a 16-story mosque at Ground Zero, and of course, a lot of people were saying it's not Ground Zero because it's around. It was at the. It, it it's was a block be, away. Yeah, it, it, it was about half a block away. Uh, very short walk, but as it happened, it should also be recalled that it was in the Burlington Coat Factory building, which was mm -hmm. severely damaged on 9-11 because mm -hmm. one of the planes, the engine flew out of the plane and flew into the roof of this Burlington Coat Factory building. And that's and that's why and that's why Muslims were able to get the building really cheap because the building was 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 damaged by part of the plane flying through the building. So exactly. think about this jihadis attack. And for me, I, I, I made a video back when it happened. I went out because everyone else was talking about it. I was like, well, I mean, I live in New York. I can just go down there and film right outside the place. So I went and made a video outside the place. And for me, it was, uh, it was especially interesting because right after 9-11, I was, of course, friends with Nabil Qureshi, who was still a Muslim at the time. I was over his house one day. And he goes, hey, check out these pictures my cousin sent me. And he was cracking up laughing. But it was pictures of like the Statue of Liberty. Uh, keep in mind, this is right after 9-11. And these are the pictures. And he's in Ahmadi. They're the most peaceful ones compared to, you know, Salafis mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, and he's saying, and his cousins, his cousins are Ahmadis. And these are the pictures they're, they're sending. But uh, it was pictures of like George Bush after he had converted to Islam. So it was all Photoshop stuff. And um, and the Statue of Liberty in a uh, in a in a burqa and things like that. But one of them, it was a postcard from five years in the future. So this was 2001, and it said 2006, and it's a postcard. So it's being the postcard is supposedly being sent from 2000. What it, what New York looks like in 2006, and the buildings that have been destroyed were all replaced by mosques and minarets and so on. And so the, the idea was, hey, by destroying the World Trade Center, we've prepared the way for the construction of mosques mm -hmm. to dominate the city. And then a few years later, it's like, hey, we're building this uh, this giant mega mosque right there in a building we got cheap because a part of the plane flew through it. And uh, and 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 you remember, Robert, you, you're a racist if you have any objection whatsoever to that. Oh, yeah. And here and here we are wondering why anyone who. Uh, 
objects to Hindus uh, building this giant temple on that site. Uh, why anyone who, who objects to that wouldn't be a racist against mm -hmm. Hindus. Well, you know, um, at the time, Sharif El Gamal said this mosque is going to be a mosque of reconciliation and peace. And yeah. I was the only one saying, look, there's not a single mosque of reconciliation and peace in the entire world. But there are literally thousands of triumphal mosques built on the site of jihad victories and on the site of the sacred sites of other people, other religions, that they destroyed the, the building or reappropriate the building and build a mosque there or put a mosque, make the building, existing building into a mosque. And uh, the scorn, the derision, the outrage was unanimous. And everybody said, see, it's a sign that this guy, because, you know, this was big news. Pamela Geller and I led rallies against the Ground Zero Mosque in New York. We got, we were stunned actually because we didn't think that it was going to draw more than a few hundred people. And there were thousands of people, 10,000, 20,000 people there. There was real anger about this, the, the Ground Zero Mosque idea. And so this was getting a lot of publicity and people were saying, this is terrible racism and bigotry that anybody could suggest that there would ever be a triumphal mosque. There's no such thing. And you had Nihad Awad and people like that saying, oh, yes, there's no idea of a triumphal mosque in Islam. And just lying yeah. through their teeth. Now and yeah. the whole world knows that there's one in India and there are many, many others. Yeah, and if you if you look at the pattern, so um, the, the heart of pagan worship, uh, according to Muslims was this, uh, was, you know, this, this Kaaba. And so they had to have that, um, bi best, biggest church in the world was Hagia Sophia. So they had to have that temple Mount important to the Jews. So they had to have that, uh, here, here's the, here's the site Hindus believe is the birthplace of, Re they have to have that in the United States. It's not like you have that, this sort of central, uh, religious center or symbol or something like that, the, that someone could take. But there is the economic center, right? There is the economic, and that was the World Trade Center. And so, hey, let's level it and uh, and, and build a big mosque there. So uh, I, I, I think you have to be blind or a complete idiot not to notice a, a, a pretty obvious pattern in all of this. But according to what we hear, if you notice the pattern, it's uh, you're, you're just a racist. Yep. So uh, in a little update, I recently read that Sharif El Gamal he was he had abandoned in the face of this immense public opposition he had abandoned plans to build the the mega mosque but he was going to make it into a kind of uh, i believe it was condominium complex that would have a mosque in, in it so that was considerably diminished from having the whole thing be a mosque and mm -hmm. i don't know how attractive he would have found it to be for non-Muslims to live there if uh, you have a mosque in the building and the call to prayer sounding all the time and so on. But uh, in any case, he's now defaulted on a lot of loans and owes a lot of people money and the whole thing sure. seems to be completely stopped. So, Robert, Allah... you're, you're, breaking my, you're breaking my heart. I love that guy. <laughs> yeah, he's an interesting guy. You know, I met him uh, a couple times. Um, one time when we had uh, the, when we were having the rallies, we also went to one of the city council meetings where they were approving I was there. the thing. Oh, you were there too? I was there, I saw him. And, yeah, I was there. Uh, he was there giving us dirty looks. And then later on, I was in Penn Station and just on my way somewhere. And he, 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 he's calling my name out. And I, and I thought, you know, who, who the heck is this? I turn around and it's Sharif El Gamal. And oh, nice. the funny thing was, is that he, he, the first thing he asked me was, do you really believe what you, in what you're doing? And I said, of course I do. Uh, what do you think? And I realized that he thinks, he believes what the Dabagandists were telling him in those days that, you know, these people, they just want money or whatever, and they don't really have any opposition in, in, on any serious grounds. And he said, why don't you talk to my, my imam, who I guess was Faisal Abdul Rauf, the very sinister nice. Ground Zero Mosque imam. And I said, sure, you know, and, and, and gave him my contact info. And he said, you know, if you, if, you, if you sit down with him, he's brilliant, and you'll come to understand Islam. And I said, great. <laughs> but uh, some, for some reason, I never heard from him.
Sharif, you can still contact me. I'd love to have that talk. You know, you know that's that's interesting because uh, I mean, Sharif might be, might have actually been a uh, like a true believer in what he was saying, even though it's, it's complete nonsense. Because you you have that right. You have like when a Muslim scholar says the Quran has been perfectly preserved. He knows that's a lie. He knows he's being deceptive. He's just, he's just, it's okay to be deceptive if, if it's helping people, you know, believe in Islam. Whereas your average Muslim, if your average Muslim says the Quran's been perfectly preserved, he's not lying. He's saying something that's false, but he's not lying. He's not intentionally deceiving. He's just saying what he heard and he thinks it's true. So Sharif mm -hmm. may not have had, Sharif may have, for all I know, may have not have had uh, evil intentions. He might have just been, oh, that's what my imam is telling me about Islam. So, so it must be true. So he may be a better guy than uh, than uh, than I thought. Yeah, I think actually so, um, because in the first place, it was clear this was not a deep thinker. This was not somebody who spent a lot of time reading and studying the Quran or anything else. He was a businessman. He was trying to make money, and he was trying to do what he thought was the right thing in building this mosque. Also, he had oh. a very interesting background. Do you know? Do you know about his background, David? Uh. Uh, nope. He was a, the son of a Muslim father and a Roman Catholic mother. And there was a big uh, custody battle because, if I recall correctly, the mother at some point fled when she realized what Islam was like and what, how he was going to grow up and f took him with her as a very small child and was raising him as a Catholic. And then there was a big uh, custody battle and she lost. And mm. so he was raised as a Muslim. Uh, mm. But uh, it seems like it's something that is not really all that deep. Uh, yeah. He's not a knowledgeable guy, which actually means that he's like a nicer guy than you might think. Hey, I got an idea. Um, since this guy really wants to build a, a giant mega mosque, he could actually do that in India. Because yeah. as as part... Yeah, so, so the, the, <laughs> the, the, the Indian court... The Indian courts actually had, you know, uh, okay, this this uh, this this mosque has been destroyed. What are, what are we going to do about all this? What are we going to do? We got Muslims who are saying one thing and Hindus who are saying something else. What are we going to do? And the decision was, okay, uh, we'll we'll, ha we'll we'll let Hindus build a temple for Ram on this site, and we'll give Muslims a different site where they can build a mosque and they can build a they can build a giant mosque there. And of course, Muslims are, no, we want that site. We want that temple site. Now, now, now think about that, because this ties into what we're saying. That site has no special significance for Muslims. It does have a very special significance for Hindus, right? So, but, and so if, if it has no special significance for Muslims and you say, okay, how about building your mosque over here? Since it's all the since it's it should all be the same to you. There's no special significance here. Build your mosque over here. And that way it won't interfere with, uh, with the Hindus. And you got the Muslims, no, 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 we want that site, we have to have that site. And what that really shows is the only reason that spot is significant to Muslims is because it's significant to Hindus. That's exactly. the only reason, right? If, 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 if it, there's no other reason for them to have that other than Hindus believe it's special and it's a sign of Islamic domination to have a spot and control a spot that is, that is prized by others. And so, I mean, they can't—they can't make it—they uh, can't make it any more obvious what their uh, what what their reasons and, and real uh, intentions are. And I just have to say, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of going around and, and destroying mosques and so on. But uh, that you know that happened—that's already happened. And so, what are you going to do there? Uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad the jihadis lost this one. Yep, absolutely. And actually, you know, that's what a triumphal mosque is. It's designed to demonstrate the victory and superiority of Islam over the other religion and so it has to be on a site that is important to the other religion otherwise it's just not a good triumphal mosque uh, now robert i seem to recall reading in a book what was that book called uh oh yeah the history of jihad maybe you've, maybe you've heard of it oh yeah you wrote it okay yeah you wrote the book the history of jihad i seem to recall reading there which i wasn't familiar with before until i read it that as muslims were conquering their way uh, eastward and conquering uh, Hindu territories, they would convert Hindu temples into mosques, but they would, they, according to this book I read, uh, they would take the idols of the Hindu temples, smash them to pieces and sprinkle the pieces on the pathway to enter 
the former temple, now mosque, so that they constantly be trampling on and insulting and degrading the beliefs of the Hindus. And so they were doing this. I was reading about this. And then I sit there and wonder why all of a sudden, once a Hindu temple is being built on the site of a former mosque, all of a sudden, you know, tolerance is the most important thing. And uh, you should never, never hurt anyone's feelings over, you know, religious sites and so on. Yep, that's exactly it. Yeah, they were uh, calculating an insult to the Hindus every time they walked into the mosque. And that was done at many mosques all over India. So, yeah, and uh, you, you can see, you can see. I mean, the the real issue here for me is just the like the like the insane hypocrisy, and you can see it every step of the way. Uh, people pointed out Dilly Hussein, you know him. Uh, oh, yeah, five pillars. This is a name I've heard. Oh, five pillars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's five pillars. So it's a you know a Sharia uh, uh, news organization in the UK, but uh, so he starts complaining. Oh, oh, oh Muslims. Oh, look, look at what the Hindus are doing. Just rest assured, blah, 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 blah. And people are like, here's your here's your reaction to turning Hagia Sophia back into a mosque just a few years ago. And it's, oh, alhamdulillah, what a great moment. And it's like, there's there's just, it. so I mentioned, <laughs> I mentioned a few minutes ago, if I knew nothing about Islam, absolutely nothing other than the fact that, that, new converts who go into Dawah instantly start defending and promoting pedophilia, that would be enough for me. The other thing that would be enough for me is if I knew nothing about Islam except the moment, the moment you adopt it, you become completely inconsistent and hypocritical and you denounce, you completely reject anything remotely resembling the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And your new moral system becomes do unto others all the things you would never, you would never dream of allowing them to do to you. That would be enough for me. It's okay if your religious system imposes hypocrisy, institutionalizes hypocrisy wherever it goes. Uh, yeah, I got a problem with it. Well, of course, that hypocrisy stems from the fact that the Muslims are the best of people, are superior as human mm -hmm. beings. As a matter of fact, the Muslims are the human beings. They're not just the best of people, as the Quran says, but the Quran also says the non-believers are animals. Mm -hmm. And so if the non-believers are animals, then the Muslims are the human beings. Obviously, they don't have the same level of rights. And obviously, <laughs> you don't behave as if they do. You know, that would be like bringing the, the, the bear into your house and serving him dinner, and pretty soon he'll be having you. So, of course, that's mm -hmm. what happens with the jihadis as well. Anyway, uh, quite a lot of jihad this week aside from that, so we can celebrate that victory, but uh, there's plenty more. This, the jihadis are still at it. This is, um, whoops, there we go. Shadi Abu Samur. And Shadi Abu Samur was at a pro-Hamas protest in Florida and there were counter protesters there protesting on behalf of Israel's defense against Hamas. And Shadi Abu Samur grabbed a megaphone from one of the protesters and uh, hit her in the face with it. And I thought, wait, wait, hit her, hit her in the face with it. He hit a woman. There are all these guys there, and he hit a woman. Yeah. Shadi Abu Samur. So, but uh, but I mean, at least they didn't, uh, you know, slash her throat and, and murder her. So I guess that's uh, I guess that's progress. He must be a moderate. Yeah, he's a moderate. All he did was hit her. But actually, I thought that it was interesting on a number of levels. One is this guy uh, hit the lady with a megaphone. Now, that's exactly what we had in California not long ago when a Muslim professor was in an argument with a uh, pro-Israel protester and he hit him in the in the face with a megaphone and the the Jewish guy toppled over and hit his head and ended up dying and the uh, the Muslim professor uh, I believe his name is Al Naji if I recall correctly Al Naji he uh, is now under arrest for it's possible that he's going to be facing very serious charges. And I think, what, why is this, what is with this violence? You know, there have been protesters and counter-protesters, and certainly things are heating up in the United States. 
<clears throat> we're seeing more violence, uh, protests in general. But it seems to me that when you have a culture and a religion that exalts and sanctifies violence, you're going to get more of this kind of thing happening. And that's what we're seeing yeah. here. Yeah, and it's also it's also combined with uh, I've been pointing out for for a while uh, they've they're going through Islam right now is going through what what they call we didn't come up with this they ca they call it the avalanche of apostasy um, so you know it's a statistic from several years ago so it's 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 it, since it was since it was uh, accelerating it's probably significantly more now but uh, as of several years ago there was a study that showed that 24 percent of young Muslims were leaving Islam uh, it's estimated that between five and ten percent of Muslims in Muslim countries are actually closet atheists mm -hmm. you've got uh, you, you've you've we've talked before about uh, Iran which uh, now apparently 60 percent of the population no longer actually believes in it even if you ask them, the popular it, it will it would be almost 100 percent of people who uh who believe in islam when it's a when it's a uh an a, a poll where where the government isn't involved it turns out most of the population doesn't actually believe in islam anymore anyway uh muslims are looking at this muslims have been looking at this realizing okay here's here's the trajectory here's the trajectory the trajectory is the the apostasy rate is massively accelerating our nations are already way weaker than other nations what's what's going to happen if we just sit here doing nothing it's islam's just gonna islam's just gonna be dead in another 10 or 20 years. i mean there'll still be islam but it's not gonna like they're going to lose hope in conquering the world if all you're doing is 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 bleeding followers all all day long and so uh they're basically in the, what we're seeing right now with iran starting instantly starting a fight with everyone you notice iran hey let's start a fight with everyone we can't even control the women in our society uh, so let's start a fight with everyone and then Hamas with with Israel and then, of course, uh, people just everywhere, everywhere you go, becoming uh, becoming more aggressive. It's Islam in Islam. The solution for everything that goes wrong is violence. And wait a minute, we got a big problem here. And I mean, the Dawa guys would say Ali Dawa says it, basically he's 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 the the arguments that Dawa guys are used were, were are now irrelevant. They're all garbage anyway. It was all fake. Uh, but the new reason to convert to Islam is good. He's he said this. He said people are going to convert to Islam because of our intolerance. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's built in their minds. We have to do something right now. We have to take a stand. We have to get really violent and do and, and just throw tantrums everywhere, throw violent tantrums everywhere, because it's the only way we're going to we're going to save our religion. And I, I'll just say I really hope this backfires. Well, here's an interesting incident in which it kind of backfired. This is Mohammed El Kurd. You may have seen this. This is a, he was uh, he's a guy I've seen before on Twitter. He's uh, a very prominent pro-Palestinian propagandist, and <coughs> excuse me, he uh, publishes a lot of stuff that's false about uh, supposed Israeli atrocities and so on. So he was at a pro-Hamas rally in London, and he says very clearly. On the video, it's very easy to hear him. We must normalize massacres as the status quo. Now, of course, mm -hmm. this immediately got him in a lot of trouble. And the police came and questioned him and so on. And now he's saying, we must, I meant, we must not normalize <laughs> massacres. <laughs> now, what do you think? What's more likely that he actually said? You just said it a minute ago that you have violence as the answer to everything in Islam. So what's more likely that he said? Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't like the, oh, I meant not. That's kind of weak. I'd have been like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not the best at English. I was trying to say we must normalize master classes. You know, these master classes that people watch and they learn all kinds of things. That's what I was saying. Not massacres. Huh. Making it even worse. Idea? Digging down, uh, digging deeper, right after he said it, and people were sending it around and saying, you know, he ought, the people ought to contact the police and so on. He says, uh, IDGAF, which, of course, is an acronym. You, you, you can tell your kids what it means, folks, at home, but I'm not going to tell you. And uh, he was, in other words, completely indifferent or professing to be indifferent to anybody's concern about it and he only said started claiming that he meant to say not 
later on, but it's very clear what he actually said, and it's consistent, of course, with Islamic teaching. Um, and and yeah. I mean, I mean, seriously, can you know? He he obviously uh, he obvious once he found out that uh, you know this might get him into trouble, then he backtracked. But I mean, can you really blame these guys for becoming uh, more uh, more aggressive and more vocal in what their true views are when they've seen? For decades, Western, the Western governments, Western journalists do absolutely nothing but back down and defend them even more. That's exactly it, man. That's it. That what on earth do they expect? That after everybody is appeasing them nonstop, 24 hours, seven days a week, why would they think there'd be any problem for saying we must normalize massacres? Meanwhile, no, you, think you know, we have, a, yeah, for... we have a very similar thing with your friend here. Ali Dawa. Did you what? see this? Yeah, there I saw he is. That one. And uh, he's going around, uh, going up to random Jews on the street and calling them baby killers and accusing them of genocide and so on. And he, he's mm -hmm. doing that. He's absolutely sure that he will suffer no consequences. And he almost certainly will not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's, just, he's just walking up to Jews who are walking into this uh, Jewish center that helps... Uh, helps i think people who are addicted to drugs or something like this and, and yeah calling them names and so on and but i mean uh, here again can you can you blame him when think about this from their perspective i live in a nation where people from my religion can uh rape gang rape drug pimp thousands and thousands and thousands of little girls for years and no one will do anything about it because that's how cowardly these people are what do you think they're going to do if he starts going around harassing jews exactly these, these, these are people who will not defend little girls what are they going to do yep exactly and so the impunity is really just across the board here's another this is abdul wahid who and uh what's the other guy's name um, I had it here. Dag Nebit. Uh, Abdul Wahid and another guy. And they were the heads of Hizbut Tahrir, uh, the pro-caliphate, pro-Sharia group in Britain. And they were just, it was just banned, which is odd. But, uh, you know, Hizbut Tahrir has been preaching uh, Sharia and caliphate all over the world and all over the west for years and nobody cared but lately for some reason it's become unacceptable maybe the british wanted to show that they're not completely spineless cowards so anyway abdul wahid is a doctor and in uh, britain of course the 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 medical profession is entirely a government agency and so he is registered with the national health service and he has to be banned by them they went on it went on for quite a long while even though uh he endorsed the rushdie stabbing he's on record in favor of hamas and none of that got him banned and only recently after a lot of public pressure even after his book tahrir was banned did he get taken off the rolls and he's no longer able to practice medicine in britain but why did it? Why was it so difficult? Why did it take so long to strike this guy? After all, what if you were a Jew and you had him as your doctor? Well, uh, I think you know. I, I don't know what his field was, but uh, you know, he could have been doing like Zabiba operations. Like, suppose you want to <laughs> suppose you don't want to go through all the pain of your head all the time, and you just want to get a little, uh, you know, a little uh, plastic surgery, give yourself a good Zabiba. Maybe he's doing stuff like that. So maybe it wouldn't even uh, uh, be relevant to other people. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Meanwhile, in The Guardian, since we're on the UK, uh, The Guardian published an article. Let's see. Today is the 24th. And so this is the 21st. That's Sunday. And uh, the article's headline is, Faced with the toughest two years of my life, I turned to Islam to give me strength and patience. Wow, great. Now, just the headline was enough, you know. And I don't even care what he says. Because just, can you imagine... The Guardian. David, what if you wrote an article today called Faced with the Toughest Two Years of My Life, I Turned to Christianity to Give Me Strength and Patience? Do you think The Guardian would even consider for a nanosecond publishing it? 
No, uh, no. You, so you, you've got journalists and they love this stuff, but it also it's also a good uh, attention grabbers, which is also what's, that's kind of what because you can listen to any of these new like TikTok converts and things like that. They know absolutely nothing. Uh, it's just become a way it's just it's just become a fun way to get attention and to view yourself as a victim all of a sudden it was a uh, i was just talking about this with ap chris rock had uh, a comedy special he's talking about the biggest pro like one of the biggest problems in society is uh every everyone is now addicted to attention uh we've created a society where everyone is addicted to attention but then he points out that there are only a few ways to get attention and he said one of the ways is to like be really really good at something but that's that's the that's the one people are least likely to do that's what it's least likely to do because it's a, it's a ton of hard work. He said, you know, you could you could just if you're if you're attractive, you could do OnlyFans or something like that and get a bunch of attention. He said, but one of the ways to get attention is to be a victim. And so notice, uh, you've got a society that's already addicted to attention. And wait a minute, all I have to do to get a ton of attention and to get myself in that coveted victim category is convert to this religion over here. Oh, sign me up. Yeah. Meanwhile, though, actually kind of in the Guardian's favor, since I just hit the Guardian, I will also note that the Guardian had a story about how the Hamas captors uh, did mass rapes on their Israeli female hostages. And there was a remarkable sentence buried way down about 300 pages into the article. Uh, it said this, rape and sexual assault are considered war crimes, blah, blah, blah. Israeli intelligence officials, experts, and sources with direct knowledge of interrogation reports of captured Hamas fighters believe units were beforehand given a text that drew on a controversial and contested interpretation of traditional Islamic military jurisprudence claiming that captives were the spoils of war. This potentially Cut. legitimized the abduction of civilians and other abuses. You said, you said controversial, you mean the yeah. Quran? The Quran and the Hadith, <laughs> like all over the Quran and the Hadith? Yeah, controversial and contested. But still, you gotta give the uh, Guardian credit because even though they pretend that this is controversial and contested, that Islam teaches that Muslims can take infidel women and use them as sex slaves and rape them at will. They admitted that it has something to do with Islam. I had, I can, I, in 20 years I've been tracking jihad every day. I don't remember any other establishment media source ever saying that this had anything to do with Islam. When Boko Haram did it, when ISIS did it, other jihadis have done it. I've never before seen any media outlet come even close to saying this has something to do with Islam, even controversial and contested. Yeah, imagine if when uh, if if when these things were happening, journalists actually did serious journalism and investigated why all these jihadi groups and so on do these things, and you know it would be embarrassing for Muslims, and so that would that would make that would if, if they were be if they were embarrassed by these attacks they might start trying to uh you know deal with the deal with the issues mm -hmm. but instead what happened after every single attack we've ever seen is uh every journalist wanted to show that he's not on the side of the islamophobes and so you praise and defend islam even more yeah and you know, notice that what you're doing is actually encouraging them. Hey, the more you attack, the more we'll defend and spread your religion for you. It's like, are, are you stupid? Are you are you insane? But that's it. Uh, but I did have a question for you on, on the banning of uh, uh, if the UK is starting to ban radical organizations. I'm thinking, what are the what are the actual practical implications of this? Because all that happens when they say, ah, this organization is banned is all the same people, with all the same views, just just change the name of their organization for the next 10 years until that one gets banned too. But if you're talking, if there, if there, a, a, any problem, any problem you're pointing out with an organization saying, ah, we have to ban this organization. Those are views that are held by like 80% of the Muslims at Speaker's Corner. 
the same, they have the exact same views. In other words, what you know, popular Dawa guys like Ali Dawa, what, what do they want? They want an Islamic state where they're going to go around chopping people's heads off. That's what they're working towards. So it, it's like, is it is it just for show? Because they're not actually. It doesn't seem like they're accomplishing anything. Is 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 it a show that they they like the the British government is completely humiliated when you know tens of thousands of people are supporting Hamas in the streets and what who do police go after? They go after the this guy over here who's waving flag and they you know they don't want to mess with these guys. Is it just is it just we're so thoroughly embarrassed and and looking so pathetic and weak right now? They want to do something to seem like we've we're on the ball here. I think that is what's happening. Yeah, uh, they're deeply embarrassed. I've got some Rochdale news here somewhere where the uh, there was a new report about the Rochdale rape gangs, the Muslim rape gangs. Uh, it said they, they're still going on. Uh, the authorities are still afraid of being called racist and Islamophobic. And, Shocker. Uh, yeah, and so, you know, nothing has really changed in terms of British officialdom, but it's it's a symptom of the fact that they still refuse to come to terms with what they're dealing with. And so they pretend that it's just this group. And so they ban this group, then they've solved the problem. And they assume that all the other Muslims who aren't in this group, they're, they're Jeffersonian Democrats. And so there's nothing to worry about. And I see this in stories coming out of France all the time. France has started closing mosques. And they say, this mosque was found to be teaching anti-Semitism and misogyny. And I think, what on earth do you think the rest of the yeah. mosque Yeah, sh teaching? Yeah, show, show me one that is. <laughs> Can you imagine? We found this church was teaching that Jesus is the Savior. Why? It's, it's unacceptable. Yeah, this is what... But I mean, I you know, everyone... Everyone needs to really absorb the fact the same journalists, politicians, police, um, social workers, prosecutors, judges, the same, all the same people in positions of uh, power or influence who for years knew that these these, you know, 12 year old British girls are being groomed uh drugged, raped, gang raped, pimped, and so on, and would not, would not dare, would not dare mention it or criticize it for fear of being labeled Islamophobes. These are the same people who are dealing with, with everything else uh, having to do with Islam, right? The, the, it's the same journalists who are reporting on Islam after terrorist attacks. It's the same journalists who are reporting on the, uh, you know, Israel's war with Hamas. It's, this, it's the same police who are expected to protect uh, the British population from terrorists. And it's the same people who would, who would, who would 12 year old girl. I mean, it's kind of it's kind of a rule for me. If I can't trust you to protect a 12 year old girl from being gang raped, I, I do not trust you at all. Period. Shut up. I'm not interested in what you have to say. Shut up. You're completely untrustworthy. And yet these are the people who, in every position of power in, in Great Britain. Indeed. And all over the West, as a matter of fact. Uh, here's another one, actually. This is Rehab Dugmash. Actually, we think it's Rehab Dugmash. I think it looks like. Uh, one of those characters, Oscar the Grouch, I think it is. But anyway, um, ninja. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, it, it, we're told that underneath that is Rehab Dugmosh, who is a woman in Canada, in Toronto, and in 2017 she walked into a store, Canadian Tire, and so there's all these people walking around buying tires for their trucks, you know, and going to, heading over to Tim's, eh? and. Uh, she starts swinging a golf club and hitting people. And also she had a knife. Anyway, she was uh, expressing solidarity with ISIS. She was put in prison. And now she's coming up for parole. And she <laughs> actually said in court, she appeared in court the other day, at least we think that was her. And she said, if I am let out, I will commit a new terrorist attack. And they're all shocked in Canada. You know, wasn't she reformed? Hey, she's been in jail six years. Well, I mean, <laughs> the, the shocking part is just the honesty, right? I mean, that's the, that's the only shocking part. 
Like, what what do you think is going to happen after yes. uh, after after uh, six years of uh, studying Islam more deeply and hanging out with uh, one's fellow terrorists? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think you know the officials involved probably really thought that she was going to come out reformed or changed, that she would have thought it over and realized that she was behaving irrationally and uh, change her ways. And this is just a persistent fantasy, you know, like de-radicalization programs. Mm -hmm. It has no basis in reality, but uh, it's still a popular view. And, and it's part of the, it's part of the real life danger to the world from politicians and journalists who keep spouting complete nonsense about Islam. It's that, you know, if you spend years indoctrinating an entire population, oh, Islam has nothing to do with terrorism. Islam says if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. Islam says there's no compulsion in religion. Those are the only two things Islam says. And under no circumstances should you look at the doctrine of abrogation or, 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 or actually read the passages in context or do anything else. You shouldn't do that. We're going to say that this is what Islam teaches. It's completely peaceful and therefore anyone who uh, interprets it violently is just ignorant or insane. Well, what does that mean? It means if you lock a person up and, and show them what the Quran really says, they're all of a sudden going to be peaceful. And so, mm -hmm. so notice people, people still aren't dealing with the problem because they don't think there's a problem. They, they think that they're, they think that the only problem is people misunderstanding the religion. They can't, they can't get their minds around the idea that there's an actual problem with the religion. So the only problem as far as they're concerned, is people misinterpreting the religion. So if you just show them how to interpret it correctly, then, you know, their hearts will melt and they'll be peaceful and tolerant. And so it's like, it's, it, you know, it, we, we, we draw attention to what Islam teaches and you have all these people who defend it and promote it. And guess what? You, you guys who are defending and promoting it and wouldn't dare criticize it, you're the reason these little girls, thousands of little girls, are were were raped and gang raped for years. You're the reason. Um, these these jihadi we could have dealt we could have dealt with jihad a long time ago if you just stopped defending it. And so I don't know. It's like all these guys they think they're the good guys. These journalists and politicians and entertainers and professors and so on they think they're the good guys, and they're actually getting tons of people killed and raped. Yes, indeed. And then when somebody tries to fight back, this is what happens. Here's a story out of Sweden. And this is a Swedish policeman, as you can see. His name is Alexander Jeremik. And Alexander Jeremik was one of five policemen who was at the Quran burning riots. When there were Quran burnings in, in Sweden, and the cops were there. Uh, they, these five cops were brutally attacked by a uh, Muslim migrant who thought that, uh, of course, it was terrible that they were allowing this to happen at all. And uh, now a Swedish court has ordered that they have to pay these five cops, half, even though one of these cops was severely injured by this guy, uh, they have to pay him each about $1,500, 12,650 Swedish kroner. Uh, they have to pay him for their role in uh, these riots. And it's, well, Alexander Jeremik is fighting this and he says, it feels like something has gone terribly wrong in the legal system here. We are there mm -hmm. doing our job, yet individual police officers must be forced to pay out of their own pockets to people who wanted us dead. Mm -hmm. That is what weird, are, isn't it? Yeah, Brilliant. What, is, what is going on here, David? What do you think? Uh, I mean, ju just when you think, uh, you know, you look and you say, okay, you know, at least the UK banned an organization. Maybe some people are catching on. Eh, Swedish go and you're like, ah, no, we can still get stupider. You think we, you think we, <laughs> you think we hit the bottom. You think we hit the bottom of the stupid barrel wrong. <laughs> we can get stupider. We can always, you, there, there's no, there's no, there's no bottom to the barrel of uh, stupidity that, that we're in. You, you know, I, I, I really get ticked. I got a message. I got a message for uh, Sweden and for the guy who attacked those cops. I, I, I don't know what to do, Robert. I don't know what to do. Your Quran's getting a little thin there, David. 
It's getting a little thin. You know why? Because people like you are attacking police officers over Quran burnings. Stop doing it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Anyway, sorry about that. Oh, there's nothing to apologize for. <laughs> that's that's what we need more of. All right. Uh, I think we're coming to the end here. Yeah, we got a little while, but there's quite a lot of jihad. So uh, I wanted to get to this fellow. Where is he now? Um, you probably saw him. But just in case anybody might not have. This is, yeah. This is a fellow at the Arizona border, and he was crossing into the United States, and a uh, reporter came up to him and started questioning him, and he says, uh, you're not smart enough to know who I am, but soon you're going to know who I am. And when, I, when I bring peace to the entire country with my peaceful, loving teachings. Yes. And it seems like he is Movsum Samadov, who spent 12 years in prison in Azerbaijan for jihad terror activity and was just released in January 2023. Well, that, I mean, that's good. So, you know, he, he, he went to prison, so he must have been de-radicalized. Yeah. And well, then, so, <laughs> well, he could get together with Rehab Dugmosh. Yeah, they, they, they could start a Dawa team. Yes. Uh, but is, no, uh, no, 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 uh, darn it. No, as soon as they start doing Dower, they're going to have to start defending child marriage. Dang it. It's, it's, it's just a requirement. They might have an explosive relationship. This is Tinley Park, Illinois. You can see it looks like middle America. looks like an average. It looks like a picture postcard, really. You know, the kind of place you want to settle down with your wife and two kids. and your. I want to move there. You, you got me wanting to move there right now. Yeah, you get a station wagon with wood siding and the whole nine yards. And uh, anyway, there was a terrible story out of there the other day. Uh, a woman, Majida Kasem, um, 53 years old, and her three daughters, Halima, Zahia, and Hanan, were all found shot dead. And the police have been very close-mouthed about it, but it, they said that it was a domestic-related shooting. And that a man was in custody. Now, what do you think, David? You you you're willing to go out on a limb on this and say who what you think might be going on? Uh, yeah, and you know, with 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 limited information, there are always possibilities. Um, it's like you can always just have someone who goes nuts or something like that, and that could mm -hmm. that could have someone from background. It's just um, we've just seen so many times that this stuff is honor related it's oh you know everyone's everyone's being disobedient and they're they're wet you know they're becoming more westernized and they won't dress as i tell them and i have to restore my family's honor and slaughter them all that's just that seems in cases like this again could be could be something different guy could have just lost it and so on but we've seen these cases before and it tends to be uh it tends to be honor killings Indeed. Uh, unfortunately, it shows a lot of signs of it. And uh, the idea comes from the Quran, chapter 18, where Kidder, well, that's what he's called in Islamic tradition, the unnamed person with Moses walking around. And Moses is upset because he kills this boy. And he explains, we killed him because he was going to grow up and be impious. And his religious parents, they deserved a better son. Anyway, uh, stories out of Nigeria. Um, the uh, Muslims came in the dark of night. Jihadis from the Fulani tribe murdered, entered Christian villages, murdered 10 Christians. That was in one place. In another place, the Jihadis entered a town and the uh, townspeople all fled to a nearby village. And then they followed them to that village, killed 30 people there. Also in Nigeria, in another town, they came out of evening prayers in the mosque and burned six people to death. Now, wait a minute, David. Doesn't Muhammad say that punishment with fire is done by none except Allah? Yeah, that's what he said, according to uh, Ibn Abbas. 
So therefore, these people are not Muslims, right? These are the hijackers of Islam we've heard so much about. Yeah, uh, uh, tragically, tragically, we do read about people like Abu Bakr burning people and so on. So it's kind of, uh, I guess it's kind of which source you go with. Yeah, this is yet another indication of the uh, fictional nature of the Hadith in general. Mm -hmm. They're so full of contradictions. Yeah, in fact, in fact, in, the, in, the, in that issue, in, in the Hadith, in the Hadith where, where we read Ibn Abbas saying, you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't burn people to death because Muhammad said that, that that's that's Allah's punishment. Allah's the one who punishes with fire. Mm -hmm. In that hadith, he said it in response to the Caliph Ali burning people to death, right? And yeah. so wait a minute, wait a minute. In, in Al Tabari, uh, Abu Bakr, the first of the rightly guided caliphs, is burning people to death. And you go all the way to the fourth of the rightly guided caliphs. These guys are the rightly guided, right? They're the rightly guided caliphs. Uh, you get to to uh, to Ali, the fourth of the rightly guided caliphs. He's still burning people, and all of a sudden, uh, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas comes along and says, "Ah, but you know, we, we don't, we're not supposed to burn people with fire," and Ali agrees with him. That's one of those situations where it's like, wait a minute, if it's under, if it, if Muhammad actually ordered, don't don't punish people with fire, and, and all the rightly guided caliphs are doing it. How did everyone forget that rule? Seems like kind of an important rule. And there, I actually think, I mean, you're familiar with. Uh, uh joshua little and and him him his uh you know he he's he's he he doesn't like us he doesn't like islamophobes and so on yeah, but yeah. His, his his view is that at one point islam was originally regional there's a there's a there's a, a there's a brand of islam in medina there's a brand of islam in kufa there's a brand of islam over here there's a brand of islam over here it was local and eventually as as islam expands they they need like one islam and so, but you had different rules in different areas for the different uh, for the different versions of Islam, and so they basically would write hadith to sort of like kind of reconcile what's going on. And so, in this situation, it looks like you have one area that burns people and another area that does it. And so, let's write a hadith to say who actually wins this uh, this battle. Yeah, there's a lot of warring hadiths like that. My next book about uh, my next book, Muhammad: A Critical Biography, does a lot of comparisons of hadiths and. Uh, demonstrates that oh but, speaking of uh, speaking 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 of your books do you have your book links in the uh in the description yeah 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 guys it, it, guys if you're uh because we see we got over a thousand people uh live and so on so if you're new here uh there are a couple books you need robert's written tons tons and tons of books um but you definitely need a copy of the critical quran you definitely need a copy of uh the history of jihad uh, given what's going on, would be a good idea to get a copy of the Palestinian delusion, and uh, if you can, sign up on uh, Patreon because this guy's uh, this guy's doing a ton of work here. Thank you very much, sir. And likewise, support uh, David. Subscribe to Apologetics Roadshow. Sign up with his Patreon as well. Uh, we are all doing what we can here, but we are bound by our finite resources. Anyway, yeah, there is a hadith in which Muhammad says, I would go to the houses of those who do not attend the prayer and burn their houses over them. Um, so it does seem clear that the hadith were just manufactured by various factions. And uh, so Little may have a point. I don't have any respect for Little any more than he does for me because he uh, rules out the authenticity of the hadiths, which is true, and says that they were forged, which is true and then says that the Isnad chains, the chains of transmission, were all forged as well, and that's true. And then he builds his whole case for saying that Aisha wasn't really nine when Muhammad consummated the marriage based on the Isnad chains. And I think, well, you just told me that they could be forged at will, and now you're basing this whole argument that's an apologetic, Islamic apologetic argument on them. Uh, the guy's kind of a bonehead, but anyway, that's the well, story. Well, he seems to believe that you can actually trace when they were fabricated. So you can you can you can examine the chains and figure out when things are being fabricated and who's fabricating them. And uh, it's this weird situation where this guy he's convinced that he's uh, defending Islam against Islamophobes by destroying all the foundations of Islam. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, hey, you you go you go, boy. I, it's, I almost I almost I almost want to get him more attention and be like. Uh, oh, you know who's you know who I really can't stand this Joshua Little guy. Oh yeah, he's really bad because then they'll all like rally around him as their new hero and stuff. Is that? <laughs> well, why don't you see if he'll uh, he'll talk to us? And uh, yeah, it'd be we'll interesting. Show. 
Yeah, so like 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 we just mentioned, like like one issue that that seems like an area where, where it would apply because I he he kind of solves an issue. You could go to one hadith and it will say uh, Muhammad allowed muta marriage, temporary marriage for a while, and then he forbade it. You go to another hadith and it says no, no, Muhammad never forbade it, never happened. He said that the Quran grants us the right to have these temporary marriages. It was a later caliph who didn't like it who abolished it. And so it's like, wait a minute, how do you have uh, uh, hadiths that are equally strong in, in their reliability and they're saying opposite things? And his position is like, hey, you went to this city, they were doing muta. You went to this city, they weren't doing, they, mm -hmm. they, they did muta. Yeah, and, that part all makes sense. And on that, yeah. I completely agree. Anyway, um, one last thing here that I think it's important to note, and this is Leicester Square. That's L-E-I-C-E-S-T-E-R, Leicester but it's Leicester in, 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 in English, English. Anyway, in Leicester Square, uh, there were three Jews who were overheard by some Arabs speaking Hebrew, and then suddenly they were surrounded by 15 angry Muslims screaming, free Palestine, and assaulted by them in the middle of Leicester Square. And so that is an indication of how emboldened once again Mm -hmm. the jihadis have become in quite recently and t totally ties into what we we're saying about the hypocrisy what were we told after every single muslim terrorist attack do not do not or any muslim about what islam teaches on any of this uh, on any of these issues i mean can you imagine can you imagine uh you know seven seven bombings or something like that if you on the other side of the world were to go around harassing muslims shame on you you support terrorism or religion no you, the, you'd be blasted as racists and islamophobes and it was muslims it was muslim organizations telling don't associate all of us with 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 the the teachings of our book uh so we're all told we don't have anything to do with that stuff don't 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 blame all of us and all of a sudden you get a you get a war in Gaza, and every Jew on the planet is free game for, for harassment or violence. Yep. And that's where we are, and there's going to be more of it. So keep your head down this week, ladies and gentlemen. And we will be back, the real God willing, next week. In the meantime, pray, hope, and don't worry.